Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Father McGarry and Dr. Wood um, are going to have a couple of remarks before we get started. Great. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wagner. Um, thank you all for joining us. A new uh, parents of our new students, both freshmen and transfer students, we are blessed to uh, have you join our Jesuit high school community. Um, so thank you for participating this evening. I wish we could be with you in person, uh, but we've been working hard, as you will hear this evening, to uh, prepare the, the various contingencies for how we're going to begin the school year. But um, I'm Father John McGarry. I'm the president of Jesuit High School. I'm in my second year as president here. I was principal many years ago from 1998 to 2005. Then I had some other jobs in the Jesuits after that, and I came back here two years ago. I'm beginning my third year as president. I've been a member of the Jesuit order for 38 years, and I've been a priest now for 27 years. So um, I'm very grateful to be back here at Jesuit. I believe wholeheartedly in our mission, which is a mission, as you know, of education of the whole person. We talk about this idea of the whole person education, mind, body, soul, and spirit. So you're sending your sons to a school that believes deeply in uh, educating the whole person, not just academics, but it's uh, co-curricular activities, spiritual and religious formation. Uh, all of that integrated together makes up our school program. So I want to start, and you will hear me say this uh, quite often, parents, to you, uh, thank you for not only entrusting your sons to our school, but for your support in uh, keeping Jesuit High School on task, on target, on mission, uh, which is the education and formation of the students that we are so blessed to have in our school. That includes your sons who are joining us as freshmen or transfer students. So becoming a man for others, a person for others, men and women for others, uh, this idea of whole person education means that we're inviting our students to be in solidarity, in community with each other. So I'd just like to start with a brief reflection uh, from a woman by the name of Marie Giblin. She says this about solidarity. Solidarity takes place when a person or community not only sees a need and acts, but commits to follow up, to endeavor to see what action is taken to improve the other's situation for the long run. Solidarity is also, also includes a kind of mutuality that goes both ways in respect and accountability when the relationship grows. Solidarity then becomes a two-way process because it becomes a relationship with both sides giving and receiving. So my dear parents, we enter into a relationship of solidarity with you this evening as you send your uh, God's most precious gifts to you, your children, your sons, to this school. And I want you to know that they are a gift to us and thank you for sharing them with us. So we ask God to bless us this evening, to bless each of you uh, in your families and to bless the community, the greater community of Jesuit High School all the faculty, staff, administration, parents, alumni, and most especially our beloved students, including members of the class of 2024 and our transfer students. May God bless us uh, this year and in these early days of the semester when we come together in unusual circumstances, um, we ask God to especially guide us during this time. Today in the church is the, the feast of St. Mary Major, which is a church in Rome where St. Ignatius uh, celebrated, St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order, the architect of Jesuit education, uh, said his first mass as a priest. So uh, we give thanks to you, God, for the vision of St. Ignatius that has made Jesuit high school and Jesuit education possible uh, for centuries all over the world and here in Sacramento since 1962. We make all of these prayers and every prayer of our hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Amen. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
thank you very much and most welcome to you all. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to my <coughs> colleagues here, Dr. Wood, Mr. Wagner, Mrs. Wagner, Dr. Desmond, Dean Theodule, Mr. O'Connor and uh, Mr. Bersea, Mrs. Sands, who are all here and others that I can't see, who are all here to, to help you. I will be on with you for a while and then I have to move to another meeting of our booster club. But if you hear uh, and, and don't remember anything else tonight, please remember that you are welcome to Jesuit High School. Thank you. Thank you, Father McGarry. We are blessed to have Father McGarry as our president, as our leader, and our Ignatian identity, our ability to advance our mission is certainly enhanced by his leadership, and I am blessed to work with him every day. Um, part of that blessing is that honesty is with me, and he is honest with me, and I appreciate that. And he told me this morning my hair was so out of control because I haven't had a haircut in a long time. So I'm wearing a hat today because he got in my head a little bit. So hopefully we can find a way to get a safe haircut, but, but I do appreciate my work with John every single day. You have the right hat on anyway. That's right. We're, we're, I don't know if you can buy these yet, but, but it is a good hat. So in a normal year, you and I, our, our families, our, our, our new families and I would have had a lot of time together. We, we would have had a family welcome event, late April, early May, some summer packets we mailed with information, things that we update every year. And this process of onboarding our families takes place over the course of months. We even say from open house to the admissions process, to the welcome events, to the mailings, to the emails, is just a long train of welcoming events to make sure that our families and our students are ready to be fully part of our community when we start the school in August. Obviously, that's the, the normal process isn't taking place. And so tonight we wanna maybe catch everybody up because we need to help our, all of our families and right now our, our, our newest families understand what they're walking into at Jesuit High School in this new environment, this environment that's new for all of us. So thank you for being here and thank you for walking through many of the details and the context setting and uh, the guidance that we can provide to make this transition to high school and to Jesuit High School the easiest transition uh, the healthiest transition, the most uh, positive trans transition possible in the current circumstances. And I have to say that I'm, I'm, as a school leader right now, obviously immersed in this crisis and in this pandemic and leading our school through the spring semester, the summer, and all the preparations for the fall. I am incredibly proud of the team of leaders we have and faculty we have at Jesuit High School who have gone above and beyond to make the high school experience on our campus and in our community to the highest quality it could possibly be given the circumstances. And we've worked tirelessly and supported each other, grown together as a team and as a community because of this circumstance. I do believe, and I've been screaming this at the rooftops to the folks uh, on this webinar, we will emerge out of this pandemic a better school than when we came into it. And we are blessed that you and your sons will be a part of that school, both now and in the, the school that, that we'll return to uh, when this is all over with. So one of the things that, uh, that we'll do tonight is Margie Wagner, one of our executive assistants, who some would say kind of run the school. And many of our executive assistants run the school and we can't do this work without them. And the, the, the wheels stay on the wagon because of folks like Margie Wagner. And she's gonna lead us through some slides and some details. And other members of the team will, will, will jump in and talk about some of those slides as well. And really guide folks to where you are now and hopefully to what the first day of school looks like in, in, in a couple of weeks. And so I'm gonna turn over to Margie right now to get us started, but you'll hear from me and from others as this evening goes on. So again, thank you Margie and uh, get us started. Thank you for your very nice words there, Dr. Wood. I appreciate that. So again, welcome to everybody. I'm glad you came. Um, unfortunately, this is an event that we would normally do in the Harris Center, 
and we would be able to meet you and shake your hand and unfortunately we can't do that. But this is not a bad substitute given the circumstances. My name is Margie Wagner. I actually work for Colin O'Connor, who is the AP for academics. And what we do in our office is we handle schedules and report cards. There's testing that goes on out of our office, challenge testing that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and that's and that's how we end books. We do a lot of books out of our office. So that's what you would find in our office. For Dr. Desmond, for example, she handles activities and some other things. But let me, I'm going to share my screen with you so we can see this presentation. Okay. So we are at New Parent 101. And like Mike said, what we really are doing is trying to kind of catch you up to all these things that we would have gone over with you before now. We like to give you the information we have in kind of bits and pieces so it's not overwhelming. Remember that this presentation is going to be posted to the website, so don't feel like you need to uh, take pictures or anything like that. We're going to post it up there so you can have it as a resource. And of course, if you have any questions, just send me an email at margie.wagner at jesuithighschool.org. I'm happy to answer anything there. So tonight what we're going to cover is we're going to cover the school calendar, the first week of classes specifically, and what the bell schedule is going to look like, especially the distance learning piece. And then when we do finally get back on campus, it will change slightly. Dr. Wood will talk about that a little bit. The staying connected is something that we use to stay connected with our parents. That's sent out once a week. We're going to talk about that. Dress code on and off campus. PowerSchool versus Google Classroom. Those are the two systems that we use uh, exclusively on campus for academics. And, and then we're going to address some questions regarding attendance and absences. The BYOD information, some of you have probably already purchased your son's device or have one at home, but we do have some um, resources for you if, uh, if you have not yet done that. Our Volunteers and Partnership Program is the volunteer hours that you share your time with us at Jesuit. And then we're going to start looking at textbook lists and how, how to buy those books and the differences between the traditional books versus the ebooks versus the iBooks and how to use the website that we've created to find those books for you. So we'll start with the school calendar. The school calendar this year looks very different than it has in the past. In the past, we've had a traditional printed calendar that had all the events on it, all the sports, holidays, student vacations, dances, football games, everything was on that calendar. Unfortunately, this year that wasn't possible. So what we've done is narrowed the calendar down into a PDF form, and then there's a live calendar on the website that will be updated regularly. If you go to our website at www.jesuithighschool.org, on the upper right hand corner under quick links, you'll find calendar and events. So that's where you're going to want to go. Anytime you have a question about, you know, what time does school start today? Um, you know, I heard there might be a football game. That's where you go check and see what's happening. We will keep that as updated as we can as events change. And now Dr. Wood's going to talk a little bit about orientations that are coming up. Thank you, Margie. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, of, uh, one more note about the calendar. One of the largest debates on high school campuses um, isn't about curriculum or um, the, the details with co-curriculars, but it's do you or do you not print a calendar every year? <laughs> because calendars by their nature change. And obviously in this climate, the calendar is going to change a lot. So the online calendar allows us to be flexible. And uh, the printed calendar was a nice kind of concrete thing you can hold on to, but it was going to be so unpredictable this year. It just made no sense to print one that we knew it would be incorrect the moment we printed it. So, so the online calendar, as Margie said, is the, the best place to go. And even in a normal school year, we would still direct you to the online calendar because that really is always the most updated and accurate place to be. 
One of the first things you'll see on the calendar are the orientations for students on August 17th and August 18th. In a moment, Dr. Desmond will talk about the freshman orientation on August 17th and what that will look like. The orientations this year and even the whole lead up to school this year, we're taking our time with. In previous years, we had the benefit of a traditional brick and mortar school environment and that did a lot of the work for us. How to get from class to class, the bell schedule, bells actually ringing on a campus. Those are all things that helped orient teachers and students to a school setting because it was familiar for everybody. We know that as we begin this year in remote learning and in distance learning with the plan to return in person incrementally as the semester goes on, it's a different experience for all of us, our teachers and our students. And I think that, and I believe that first impressions are important. So the first experience our teachers have with your sons in the distance learning environment needs to be an excellent one. It can't scare them, both your sons and the teachers on the outset. So we're gonna take our time starting this year to make sure that we all get it right. So while the students are having orientations on August 17th, uh, and the freshmen, especially August 17th, upperclassmen on August 18th, the whole week prior to that of August 10th, we're having professional development for the faculty and staff with a key emphasis for our teachers on how to teach in the distance learning environment, even though it will be synchronous and live teaching, how to teach the students who are at home and in person, how to do assessment in this environment. We've been training all summer and we're gonna finalize that training next week so that when we return to school and your sons are in classes with their teachers every single day, their experience is a great one, our teacher's experience is a great one, and we're building community and trust from the very beginning. So our deliberate start to the school year is meant to prioritize that positive experience. Maybe there's one or two fewer days of school in the semester, but if we started poorly, that increased class time will be wasted anyway. So we want to focus on quality, community building, and trust. So Dr. Desmond will talk a little bit about the freshman orientation experience on August 17th. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Uh, so attendance, every, uh, orientation is important every year. It's going to definitely be extra important this year um, for all of your sons to make sure that they're present. Um, we'll be emailing them all probably late next week um, to their Jesuit email addresses. It seems like they've all been uh, actively using them, which we appreciate. Uh, they'll be getting an email that'll have uh, their Zoom login information since it will be uh, a virtual Zoom uh, orientation. And when they log in, there'll be a lot of kind of what we're doing now, a virtual meet and greet. So they'll get uh, time to um, meet Dr. Wood, uh, they'll have a special uh, few minutes with uh, Father McGeary as well. They'll also meet Dean Theodule, our Assistant Principal of Academics, Colin O'Connor. And then they'll also meet some of the key people on this call, like Mrs. Wagner and um, uh, Jared Brescia, who will help them with so many other really practical things like technology, like textbooks that are going to come up for them um, during that first week of classes. So for them to be able to put a name to a face, um, whether it's just from an email conversation they might be having with um, uh, regarding textbooks or technology, it, it really will help them to see and virtually meet some of these key folks on campus. So that's one part of, of orientation, the virtual meet and greet. They'll also be during that time meeting our program directors who they'll be interacting with throughout the semester. So our athletic director, our director of campus ministry, our director of the Office of Service and Justice will be where they'll be doing their work um, in uh, doing Christian service. Uh, the other person that they're going to hear from is one of our counselors from the counseling department during orientation. So it might not be your son's actual counselor. They'll get that uh, time um, after uh, the first day of instruction, but they will be hearing from a member of our counseling department. Uh, we'll also have some time um, when students can Here's some of the information we'll be covering tonight. So information on class schedules and the bell schedule. If they have any issues, um, you know, understanding. I know one of our Q&A questions is about flex periods. So some of that uh, information they'll get to hear firsthand during orientation. The big chunk of uh, their orientation uh, is going to be the technology piece. So we always have a tech piece to orientation. 
we always have time for them to learn about how to log into the Google Classroom that's specifically for their class of 2024. Uh, each class of Jesuit has a Google Classroom that's for their class where they can hear about announcements, activities, and resources. We keep that uh, up to date all the time for them. So we're going to on that orientation actually help them to log into that class of 2024. It's officially called an AMDG 2024 page. Um, they'll get to practice that with us so that once they've gotten the invitations from all of their classroom teachers to join their class Zooms, I'm sorry, their cl Google Classrooms, they'll have a chance to you know, feel comfortable about that, ask questions about that. Their teachers will all be sending out that information at the end of next week. So by the end of the day on Friday, October, uh, August 14th, they'll be receiving an invitation from each one of their teachers um, to join Google Classroom. It's possible once they get to orientation on Monday, they'll already have joined every class. They, they tend to be really uh, quick learners at this. So don't be surprised if your son has already done that over the weekend before his orientation. Uh, if he's stuck with that at any point, uh, that information will, will take place during orientation. Uh, finally, the tech orientation will include information on how your son can use his Jesuit student uh, Zoom account. We'll provide that information in advance to his email, but if he has any issues with it, we'll address that in person at orientation. And finally, the tech orientation also covers opportunities once class starts on the on Wednesday August 19th how your son can utilize some structured hours uh, for getting help we're gonna have a real-time help desk um, offered for actually all of our students at all grade levels so we'll share information about how to access that help desk and also when to access that help desk and Dr. Wood, I think your next slide on the schedule for the first few days actually uh, can show parents right now when that help desk time will be open and how it'll continue throughout the duration of the day to help students troubleshoot any questions that come up if they're having trouble logging into their Google Classroom, um, if any, any issues at all um, can get addressed during that help desk on the schedule that you have there. Perfect, thank you for that great explanation. And is there any more, Fadia? Uh, there, there is more that has to do with later on in the day on the 17th, but I think I'll save that for later because it kind of is more about the fun part of uh, freshman orientation day. So I'll save it for later, but I did want to get through kind of the nuts and bolts of that 8.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. part of orientation that takes place Monday morning, uh, August 17th. Great. And there is some fun stuff in the afternoon we're excited to share with everyone soon. So as we move past those orientation days, you can start to think of the days of August 19th, 20th, and 21st as really a, con a continuation of that orientation where they now meet their classes and their classroom teachers in real time with their classmates. And we're doing this again with a very deliberate approach so that a student who has trouble maybe logging into that first Zoom session uh, or Google Classroom doesn't feel penalized by that experience where they've missed out on something or now all is lost and they can't ever catch up. We all know what that's like as students or employees to feel like we're behind or left behind and you have nowhere to go or feel like you're helpless. That feeling of anxiety um, and disconnectedness can really harm the rest of that semester and it might take a long time to catch up. The care we're trying to provide for your sons is meant to make this learning experience positive and that makes that means he has to be comfortable feel prepared so when learning begins he's in the best possible position so this first first week of classes is a very short schedule they're just going to meet with their teachers one time for a simulation of what is the regular bell schedule which we'll, we'll share in a moment as you see at the beginning of the day there's a help desk so as they're trying to log on to things any things they have questions about before classes begin they can log on to a live help desk, desk session and get the help they need. Then on August 19th, they will log on just before 8.30 to their period one class. And they're logging on to a, a Zoom session with a special Zoom account, a Jesuit only Zoom account, 
We have upgraded our Zoom technology. So there's a, a great deal more options for security, accountability, attendance taking. So it's not just a random Zoom session. It'll be built into the daily schedule for the students. They'll experience that first teacher and they'll move throughout the school day. At any point during that school day, if there's a trouble, they can find that help desk and get back on track. And the teachers know this might be a day where students are coming in and out because they're having some challenges. But that experience will get them prepared to uh, begin the following week in what will be a full week of, of real-time learning. One of the things I want to note here is that as we go through the schedule and with the Mass of the Holy Spirit, the Mass of the Holy Spirit will be live streamed from our Chapel of the North American Martyrs. And it is a tradition in all Jesuit schools, high schools, and universities to begin the school year with the Mass of the Holy Spirit. We recognize and praise uh, the Holy Spirit in our midst in the beginning of the school year and ask it to be with us throughout the school year. And we encourage your sons, of course, will be asked to be there, but all families are invited to join us for the live stream of the Mass of the Holy Spirit to finish that first week of time that we'll have together in this school year. The rest of that time uh, is lunch. That'll be lunch you know, on their own. We're <laughs> not going to feed them. That's at, at your homes. And uh, that'll be more time for the faculty and staff to do any fine tuning for the first week of classes. And Margie, we can go to there now. So this bell schedule, I call it a bell schedule because when we return to campus, this will actually be uh, very similar to the bell schedule we'll be using for a regular in-person classroom experience. One of the things I want to note about the structure of this is it's meant to be usable in the distance learning environment and the same experience in the in-person environment. So we're not moving between distance learning and in-person learning as two separate experiences. In fact, our distance learning experience is meant to simulate the classroom experience. You, you might find on our website, uh, Dean Theodore and I at different times have modeled the in-classroom camera technology that we're gonna be using to simulate that, simulate that experience for your son so they feel like they're part of a classroom as opposed to always simply on a Zoom screen. To begin the schedule, you'll see at the beginning of the day, between 8 and 8.30, are collaborations and office hours, and on Friday, an extended collaboration. The collaboration periods are really meant for your sons. They're not every single morning for every single student, but they'll be scheduled throughout the semester for especially times with counselors. Counselors right now use the majority of the collaboration time. There are some fun things uh, sprinkled throughout, but for the most of the time, uh, your sons will meet with their counselors for college prep, for class selection, for mental health and wellness, all sorts of things that we'll be using our counseling program in that collaboration period. That includes when they're in person and when it's fully distanced and a combination of both. The other thing that will be there are office hours. All teachers will host at least once a week office hours during that time. The students who don't have a collaboration period can join for office hours, also a synchronous experience for excuse me, students to be with their teachers. Um, any type of out of class questions they might have, the teachers, teachers will be present for them in that before school collaboration and office hour time. We then run through a very standard, somewhat traditional eight period bell schedule, which includes a lunch period in there. That lunch period is uh, for all of our, our faculty and our students have a break during the day, whether they're at home or on campus. On Friday mornings, we have a longer collaboration period, which allows primarily for the faculty and staff to do some really important work in adult faith formation, in our work on being uh, uh, on anti-racism and on our academic work. So we use that time for the own professional development, spiritual development, and moral development of our faculty and staff. But there will also be some opportunities for students to use that extended collaboration period, such as club sign-up day and things like that. If you move down to the next slide, this is a small variation on the weekly bell schedule, but this is noting when students actually return to campus. One of the differences here is while it's mostly the same, you'll see that the lunch periods are split. If you go into a previous video, Mr. O'Connor 
has gone through the Bell schedule in great detail and explains the in-person learning schedule where why we split lunch is to spread students out throughout the school day to minimize crowding in certain areas. So you can look at uh, a previous video, it's on the website about how the schedule actually operates. But I just wanted to note that the starting schedule with all distance learning doesn't require that we have a split lunch period. The other thing I wanna note about this schedule, and this is a question that uh, I think we need to repeat over and over again to our families, is that when in-person return in-person learning returns, it'll at first be phased in where parts of the student body, say half of the student body, will come to class on a particular week or a particular set of days during the week, while the other part of the student body is at home learning uh, from the distance learning model. But what's important is it's exactly the same thing, meaning if I'm a student and I'm in the classroom and I'm with the teacher, my classmates who are at home are watching the exact same classroom experience using our pan, to, pan tilt zoom cameras from the, that are mounted in every single classroom across campus. So regardless of the model we're in at home or in person, it's always a live classroom experience, um, which hopefully simulates the structure of a school day, which we do very much believe that students need. So I believe that's all I have there on that particular uh, schedule. We discussed collaboration periods, just some notes about them that they are required when students are asked to be there. The regular attendance expectations come with a collaboration period. If a student does not have collaboration, does need to attend virtually obviously, or be on campus for that time. That's only for the collaboration period students. And I believe that's all I have on that right now, Margie. Did you want to make any remarks about the staying connected? Sure. So in previous years, I have sent out a monthly newsletter, the principal's newsletter. One reason it was monthly is because the predictability of the school year, as I mentioned before, was such that it only took a month to announce what was happening next because there was predictability and some routine to everything. Since March, when we went on distance learning, we've begun doing weekly messages to our families just because there's so much that can change and so much that is that we need to be nimble about that we now send a staying connected weekly message. It also allows all parts of campus to communicate because in this environment, we need to make sure that all parts, counseling, the academic office, athletic office, all have access to that weekly staying connected message because the interest or the, 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 the things your, your sons are doing will be impacted on all parts of our campus. We wanna give them an avenue to maintain updated communication every single week. So the staying connected is your go-to, hopefully once a week message. We wanna limit our messages to you to that staying connected. If you see a message that comes independent of that, it's because we forgot to put it in, which is unlikely, or something changed quickly enough that we really want to get on your radar soon. But that's going to be your go-to messaging place for the entire school year. and may actually be the model we use going forward as a school uh, for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Dean, seen it all. It's time to talk dress code. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, let me start by saying, uh, responding to one of the questions in the Q&A about um, pickup information uh, regarding orders that have already been placed. You will be receiving, if you placed an order in the, from the original shop, uh, you will be receiving an email by the end of this week with more details about the pickup uh, of those items. Uh, so if you have not received that email uh, by the end of this week, um, you can contact us and we can figure out uh, what, what's going on. Some of the uh, items in the dress code store uh, could be shipped to home. Some of them could only be shipped to school. So there's no uh, hard and fast answer that's going to apply to everyone. Um, and so that's why we will be sending a specific communication to the folks who will need to come to campus to pick up their order by the end of this week. Um, now, the dress code as it pertains to the school day for your sons, uh, as Dr. Wood said, uh, we want to simulate the classroom experience as closely 
uh, as possible during di digital learning uh, so as to ease their transition to uh, in-person learning when we get to that, uh, to that point. Uh, and so the dress code is a part of their in-person learning experience. And we have adapted slightly the dress code um, to apply in very similar ways uh, in the digital format. So uh, in a in-person format, the dress code would be khaki, uh, single colored khaki style pants or shorts. Um, so any color, no patterns, but any color would be okay. And then a Jesuit polo shirt uh, or other button-up shirt uh, for Monday through Thursday. Um, during distance learning, we're going to simply ask that they wear their Jesuit shirt or a Jesuit t-shirt from an activity, be it um, one of the plays or a club uh, or wherever they may have a Jesuit t-shirt from. Um, what we will ask is that during distance learning, our students are in either their Jesuit polo or Jesuit t-shirt, uh, and then that no hats or hoods are, are worn during distance learning, uh, because again, to simulate the classroom experience, we would not allow students to wear hats or hoods in class. Um, the rest of the dress code information is outlined in the um, st student parent handbook more detailed, uh, but there's one item that I do want to cover specifically that pertains to uh, jackets. Um, those do not have to be Jesuit authorized jackets. Um, and so the important piece here is to differentiate between a sweatshirt uh, or um, a windbreaker and a heavy jacket. When we say heavy or rain protective non-Jesuit -Je authorized jacket is allowed, we mean something that is meant to keep the student uh, warmer than a sweater or obviously uh, protect them from the, the elements like rain. Uh, something that they would normally take off um, upon entrance into an indoor facility. Uh, those do not need to be Jesuit authorized. Anything else that they wear though should be uh, Jesuit authorized with the JHS logo on it. Um, we really believe that the dress code sets a tone and a mindset. Uh, we want our students to be prepared to learn uh, and to be prepared to be an active member of their classroom community. Um, and we also want to be able to use the dress code as a way to limit unnecessary distractions. That being said, when we do return to campus, uh, we anticipate that face coverings will still be mandatory for everyone on campus. Um, and it will be the responsibility of each individual student to bring their own face coverings to school each day. We ask that you bring two in case one of them gets wet or damaged uh, during the course of the day so that that student has a second option uh, that he can keep inside of a, a, a bag in his backpack uh, with them at all times. Face coverings should obviously be clean and neat uh, for his own uh, benefit, uh, but the key element here again as a means of limiting unnecessary distractions and really setting a positive tone for the classroom environment. Um, our expectation is that all face coverings um, can have a geometric pattern or be a solid color, but should be free of symbols or written messages. Uh, there are gonna be some options for Jesuit specific masks that will have the Jesuit logo on it or may say the word Jesuit or some variation of a Jesuit logo. Those are authorized and approved to be worn at school at all times, but they are not required. Uh, so don't feel that you have to go out and get one. It is okay if your son just wears a plain black or plain white or plain blue uh, face covering when we do return to campus. Thank you, Doc Dean Theodore. I almost called you doctor, sorry. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> You're working on it. We're getting there. Okay, so the next part we're going to be talking about is PowerSchool. We use PowerSchool and Google Classroom as our main ways of communicating with students in regards to grades and homework assignments. The main purpose of PowerSchool is so that you can see and your son can see how he's doing in a class on a regular basis. This includes attendance and we are going to strongly encourage you to do your attendance notifications on PowerSchool. 
when we send you that information on how to access PowerSchool, we are going to include instructions on how to set up your notifications. So for example, um, if your son, if you have to go to work and your son is late to class, you could actually look in PowerSchool and see that he was marked absent immediately. Now, having said that, remember that PowerSchool is live and will change while you're watching it. So it's a little bit like the stock market. Don't check it all the time, you will make yourself crazy. But you will be able to see grades, current grades, you'll be able to see current attendance, you'll be able to see if he's missed an assignment because there will be uh, little notifications in the grading that'll show you a little M, for example, if he's missing an assignment. The nice thing about PowerSchool too is you, it is available via an internet connection or an app on the, um, on the Android or the App Store for Apple. Keep in mind, however, that apps generally are not as robust as the desktop version of something that could be. So for example, when we sent you an email, your son an email and said, log into PowerSchool and look at your schedule, but don't use the app, it's because the app doesn't support showing the schedule prior to the first day we take attendance. So there's no way for them to see it there. So if you're looking for something that on the app that you can't find, odds are pretty good it's going to be on the desktop version. So keep that in mind. Every class period during the day is gonna take attendance. So every time they do that, you're gonna see either a blank, which means he's present, or an AB, meaning he's absent, or there's a tardy notification. All of those things are going to show up in PowerSchool Live. So if you know that he's not going to be at school that day, he's sick, your internet is down, whatever it is, you do need to call the dean's office and call the absence line, and we'll get there in a little bit with the phone number, and just let them know, please do this before 9 o'clock in the morning. If you don't call by nine o'clock in the morning, we're gonna call you and go, hey, we don't see Junior and we wanna make sure he's safe. So do make sure you do that call. There is a voicemail and you can just leave a message there at that time. Okay, so PowerSchool is something that both parents and students use. You will see the same thing that your son does at the same time, sorry boys, but that's how it works. Google Classroom is for the kids only. This is where their course information is going to be. This is where their homework is going to be assigned by the teachers. Homework is generally assigned by four o'clock in the afternoon on the day they met in that class. But parents cannot log into Google Classroom. We just, it's not supported by Google for us to be able to do that. However, it is very appropriate for to ask your son to see it so you can see what it is the experience he's having with Google, with the homework, looking at the classroom, all of that information um, will be there. It's just that parents won't have direct access. Um, Dean Theodore, do you wanna talk about attendance? Absolutely. So um, as we've said a couple of different times now, uh, we want the digital learning experience to uh, as closely as possible simulate the live in-person experience of the classroom. That includes attendance. Uh, and so during digital learning, much like if we were in person, students will follow the eight period synchronous class schedule as outlined on our, our school calendar. Now note, eight periods don't meet each day. Only five of those eight periods meet each day. Um, but we will follow that rotation just as outlined uh, on in the previous slides uh, and is uh, listed on our website uh, for our eight period schedule this year. Attendance will be taken at the beginning of each period of the day. Uh, and so uh, if your son is not in class on time, um, which is defined as the start of that particular period, when you look at the calendar, you, or when you look at the, uh, the school day schedule, I'm sorry, you should note that there's a 15 minute passing period between each class period. Uh, and if we were in, when we are in person, that 15 minutes will be used for the student to transition from one classroom to another physically. In digital learning, we will use that passing period as an opportunity for them to go to the bathroom, to get a snack, 
uh, to take a really quick break, but they are expected to be in class by the start of that class period and attendance will be taken at the beginning of every class period. So when Mrs. Wagner suggested that you sign up for attendance notifications, I'm going to second that suggestion strongly. Uh, you do have the ability to, to control the frequency of your notifications. So if you want to get them once daily, you can set that you you can choose to set it to to receive a notification daily. If you want to get it once weekly, you can set it to, to give it to you once weekly. How often, however often you would like to see a record of your son's attendance automatically notified, uh, receive a notification that is prepared. Um, you have you have that choice. Um, but if your son is more than five minutes late. He will be marked absent and will not receive attendance credit without first contacting the dean's office. Again, this is just in line with our in-person learning practices as far as attendance is concerned. Uh, as Dr. Wood mentioned earlier, he will be logging into Zoom through a school-specific account um, that we set up. That will allow us to track some of his attendance uh, on the back end. So we will know when he signs in, we will know when he signs out. Uh, if, he if he were to leave class early on a particular day, we would be able to go back in and look and see exactly what time he left that particular class period. So our, our expectation for attendance uh, and our attendance policies will be enforced much in the same way uh, that they would be enforced in person. Uh, and so we expect for them to be there on time and be there for the duration of the class period. Uh, and again, use the passing periods for bathroom breaks, a quick snack or just an opportunity to stretch between classes. Can I add a quick note to that as well, Dean Theodore? Yes, please. One thing that I, I want to note is in a regular school day, as we've experienced for most of our lives, when you drop your child off at school, they're at school until you pick them up from school. So you know they're there. You might not know exactly what's happening, but you at least know they're on the campus. If you're going to work every day and your son is sitting at home until we can come back to campus in the distance learning environment, you don't have necessarily know that's, that that's going on. What's he doing at home? Is he logged on to a system? Um, is, he, is he playing video games instead? It's just much more difficult for you to be aware of that particular uh, reality. These safeguards that we have in place are allowing you to have more confidence about what your son is doing during a regular school day. We're gonna know if he's on the, on the call. We're gonna know if he's logged in. And if there's some challenges there, we need to, to work on correcting that. We'll have some data to, to help support you in your role as parent to make sure your son is fully engaged in the classroom. We know that this environment is easier for some and harder for others. So we wanna make sure that we have all the tools available to make sure that he's following the structure of the school day as best he can. And Dean Theodore and his office are doing everything they can to put those protections in place to enforce that. The other thing I would say, and this is a, a little bit of a nuance, but it's important to note right here so you don't get mad at your sons for the wrong reasons. Every class period will start on time, but because of the nature of the distance learning environment, we're not actually, we're not gonna require that teachers are on a screen or in their classroom for the entire 60 minutes of that period. They'll be there for at least half, if not most of the time, but it might not be actually pedagogically sound for them just to sit there as the kids do say a group work or a project or do some in-class writing. So you might find at the end of a period that your son is not actually on an actual call. That doesn't mean he's just bailed on the class. It might mean that the teacher has um, ended the actual live session to do some pedagogically sound uh, non-live stuff in that particular time frame. So just be aware that might be the case in some of your classes. Most of our teachers are gonna go wire to wire because they do, but sometimes it was not helpful to be, you know, the entire period on the Zoom session. We've learned that from our previous experience in distance learning and from our, our best practices work as well. So just a couple notes there as well. The last piece I'll add to that is if you have any questions about your son's attendance, uh, you know, if you're a working parent like most of us are, um, and, and you just want to make sure that you have just have some questions, you can always contact the dean's office, and I'll be happy to go through and do a little bit of research for you. And again, the, the Zoom accounts will allow me to tell you to the second almost 
when he logged in and when he logs out. Uh, I'd be happy to support you as a parent uh, in answering any questions that you have about whether or not your son is actually holding up his responsibility as a student in class. I'm gonna jump in one more quick thing and it's not in the slides and that's not Margie's fault, it's mine. Um, one of the things we learned in the spring semester is that some of the disconnectedness that happens in distance learning that we're resolving by what you're hearing right now is still causes some difficulties for schools to how do you reach out to a student or a family if something's going on? We're just calling down to the dean's office or the principal's office and starting our, our work. The logistics of caring for students and for families gets a bit more complicated in this environment. So at the same time, we have a, a quite a few program directors and other members of our community whose work really takes place on campus. And what they would traditionally do on a regular school day is difficult to replicate in the distance learning model. But these are folks who care about our school and our mission and want to help. So we're going to put together, it's called a Cura team or a care team, which is a group of folks who act in many ways like caseworkers. And these are educators who've been at Jesuit for many, many years who want to find a way to be helpful, even if they can't be as helpful on campus right now. So Dean Theodore is going to use this group to say, hey, we're seeing a student who's kind of slipping away. Maybe it's academically, maybe it's emotionally, maybe we're hearing something from peers or parents. And these people have the time now and the freedom to reach out and do some more one-on-one -on -one help for that student. And Dean Theodore will be able to say, this is a great Cure a team member for this particular student, um, given what that student's going through and that particular employee skill set. So we are caring for these son to these students in a variety of ways, acknowledging the reality of the wor work that they're going in, and I think that's going to be an unparalleled experience at Jesuit High School that that we're committed to every single day. You'll learn more about that later, but I wanted to note it here. Thank you for that, Dr. Wood. As Mrs. Wagner said, um, if your son is going to be absent, and let's define what that means, particularly in a digital space, um, I'm sorry, particularly if we are in person, um, what, when we mean absent, we mean he is not available to learn for class. So we will consider him being, when we're back in person, we will consider him being physically in his desk as being present for, for school in, a, in exactly the same way as we will consider he is logged into the Zoom session from home on time um, to be in attendance uh, uh, and, and accounted for. So when we say if your son is absent, we mean he's, he's neither available for in-person learning or digital learning. If that is the case, if he's sick or he has an appointment or something that's gonna cause him to miss uh, some or all of the school day, Please call the attendance line by 9 a.m. to report the absence. You can see the phone number there on the screen. It's area code 916-480-2135. It's a voicemail service that will allow you to leave a message identifying your son. And all this is in the voice message as a reminder for you. Identifying your son and his reason for, for absence so that we can mark his attendance um, as an excused absence, excused by you, uh, in power school. Uh, and so that his, his attendance is always reflected accurately. Um, again, if we are uh, in in-person learning and your son needs to leave for leave school early for a doctor's appointment, you can simply send him with a note uh, prior to the start of the school day that says he needs to leave at whatever specific time for his doctor's appointment, uh, and we will give him our own internal notes that will he will be able to then show his teacher, and his teacher will allow him to leave. Uh, in time for that uh, to be picked up for that appointment. Margie? Yeah. As, as uh, Dean Theodore was talking, and I was listening, Dean Theodore, I promise, uh, <laughs> there's some great Q&A in there that might be a, uh, appropriate for maybe Colin O'Connor to answer and some others that okay. maybe they can knock off the list, not, not the written ones that have great answers to them, but the live ones before we jump into with some more really important nuts and bolts stuff but all the nuts and bolts stuff tend to be helpful when we understand the larger picture. Is that okay if Colin does that? Absolutely. Mike, is there one you wanted me to start with? Um, I mean, I see period nine. There's a question here um, about a schedule that shows a period nine or a period 10. Those are classes that are taught, that are not taught as part of the eight period schedule. 
Uh, there's a number of different things a freshman might see. There's his health class, um, which is tied to where his PE class would be in the schedule. Um, and then the service and justice program is run through the ninth period or the 10th period. And that's also tied to the theology one class. Um, so more information about those two specific period nine or period 10 classes will be coming uh, as we actually get started into the school year. There was a note on the schedules that were sent home, um, sent to freshman families about health in particular. We're needing to kind of rethink how we do health this year uh, because of the difficulty with actually running physical PE. Um, so we're going to take another week or so or a couple weeks. I think we said September, you would get some information about uh, how we're going to run the health curriculum portion of that class. But that's what a period nine uh, would be. So it's things that are either additional to what's actually like happening in the eighth period or eight period schedule, um, or it's a co-curricular, which you might see in upperclassmen schedules. Um, so if they're ever in chamber singers or something like that, or one of our many bands that practice and rehearse outside of the school day. How about the question, Colin, about distance learning and, uh, sorry, recorded classes during um, live sessions? Sure. So uh, the question here is during distance learning, will class instruction or discussion be recorded and available to students afterwards in case of absence or for review? Uh, the short answer is no. That's not our plan. Um, with the, the way we're set up to do synchronous meetings and kind of replicate what the on-campus learning environment would be like under, you know, quote unquote, normal circumstances of what's normal anymore. Um, the, the whole idea, the whole focus for us is synchronous, synchronicity. Uh, so that means we need, we want students to be attending class. We don't want to um, kind of programmatically provide any reason why students would not want to try to be present for that distance learning. Uh, when the teachers are offering that class. Um, that being said, you know, there's still going to need to, we're going to need to have some, some structural support for students who may need to miss a class on a given day. Uh, but that's no different from any other year when a student might be absent for a day or a couple days in a row. Um, keeping up with Google Classroom information that the teacher provides, um, you know, teachers will adjust their, you know, due date expectations for students who may have missed um, with an excused absence, you know, provided they're reaching out to the Dean's office as uh, Dean Theodore has already outlined. So in that way, we're, we're not planning to, um, nor will we be asking teachers to provide recordings of classes for, um, for students who, who may miss for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we may set up when we get close to, uh, get closer to being able to return to campus, we can talk about developing buddy systems and stuff for students to use. Um, but there's a lot of analog technologies that we can leverage to to keep students caught up if they have to miss for any various reason. Another quick question here that was a good one was the microphone in the classroom setup. Mm, sure. The, um, I can actually do that one because I saw it today. They Go mount for it. or and maybe George you can maybe handle that because they've upgraded the technology since we modeled it for them a few weeks ago. Yeah the purpose the purpose behind the microphones there was to, oops, sorry, my wife's gonna turn her speakers down. <laughs> We're in the same room. <clears throat> Want me to come over there and do it from there? So the purpose, we chose those mics, you know, I'm gonna come over here. Hang on a second. George and Margie make a great team here at Jesuit High School. <laughs> so George, you just have to unmute yourself there. I love telling our director of technology. Hey, uh, to there we go. My wife had unmuted me. That's great, great power. <laughs> smart, smart man, George. Smart man. <laughs> so the purpose behind those mics was to allow for classes of different modalities to occur. So sometimes you have a very teacher-centric class, and sometimes you have a very um, student-teacher-centric situation where students are asking questions and there's dialogue going on. So we wanted a microphone that could pick up both of those environments well. So sometimes so part of it's going to be teachers are going to have to learn to enunciate perhaps a little bit louder, loud, more loudly than they do normally. Um, uh, we do have some foreign language teachers that are going to experiment with little portable mics because they want to really be able to enunciate well and they're worried about that mic. 
So we've invested in a few of those portable um, uh, systems where we'll mic the teachers. And then if we, if we do have some problems um, uh, with that in the classroom, we can always purchase some more of those and get those in place. Um, uh, and we'll be basing all of that on your feedback. So let us know if there, if there is sound problems and we'll address them as best we can. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. Um, there's, a, there's a question that just showed up. Uh, we have, uh, will students be able to see each other during class? Yes, since we're requiring that students during distance learning have their cameras on, um, you know, students can change from speaker view to gallery view so they can see the faces of all of their classmates. Um, and, you know, teachers may direct them to, to do that in different ways and teachers will be using breakout rooms. So there'll be not just an opportunity to see each other, um, but also to speak in small groups, um, I think quite frequently. In, in listening to the experience of some teachers who did uh, full distance learning for summer school, as well as some of the experiences that people had in the spring when they were running synchronous sessions, the breakout rooms on Zoom uh, have like really winning reviews from our instructors. And uh, so I would not expect that this is gonna be, you know, 60 minute lectures. That's that's not what we're, what we're aiming for here at all. We're looking for uh, some interactivity, the same kind of interactivity that uh, we would hope you would come to expect from us uh, in our traditional teaching environment as well. Um, there was a, there's a prior question. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, the person who asked this. Um, I was waiting for the appropriate time because talking about uh, dress code was not really the appropriate time to jump in and address this one, but this is a big question. The prior goal was, some of you may recognize me, my hair's a little bit longer than it was a month and a half ago when I talked about this, but our goal was um, a return to campus uh, such that a student who wanted to be on campus every day could do so. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wood, that, that's still our goal. That's very much our desire uh, as an institution, our desire as educators is to be with our students in the spaces that we, uh, that we feel most comfortable, which is our classrooms. Um, but since we announced that particular plan, so many things changed in the local environment and then also in terms of the guidance that we were getting from the county and from the state um, about the impact of community spread, not just our ability to mitigate on our campus, but the, the impact of community spread um, plays a really big role in determining whether or not we can bring uh, X number of people onto campus. And so our goal now, or our plan now is, as we're able to make a return to campus, to phase it in, um, to make sure that we're, we're appropriately addressing all of the elements of our pretty lengthy mitigation plan. Um, and then even if we hadn't, if, if we hadn't received, you know, changes in guidance or anything like that, without the ability to do what we were kind of planning to do with orientation week, to slowly introduce students to campus through orientation week, uh, it would be foolish to try to bring everyone back onto campus and expect them to be able to easily navigate uh, the campus, find all of their classrooms. So we wanted to, to be able to do that slowly. Um, so as we're able to announce those kinds of plans, as it becomes feasible for us to do so, we'll give some more information about uh, how you can expect that phased return to campus. Um, and that means, you know, we're gonna be leaning pretty heavily on the flexibility of our schedule, of the, the ability for the schedule to adapt pretty fluidly from distance mode to on-campus mode, because there's a, if you think of it as a faucet, there's a faucet that we can turn that allows for students to be present um, in both places simultaneously. Um, you know, half the class, a quarter of the class, whatever that percentage ends up being. And I'll just add one more thing, and I'm gonna hop off this, I have another call to, to go to in a little bit. So if I, if I leave the call quickly, um, it's for something else I have, I have to go be a part of. But the other thing is that our plan, by spreading out the campus physically, and by spreading out the classrooms to an eight period schedule. So even if all students return to a class, there's typically less than 20 in the classroom. When schools in our area are allowed to reopen, we can do so with greater pace, hopefully, um, and get to that full return as fast as any school in our area. So our plan allows for the most efficient and, um, and full return possible. And as Mr. O'Connor said, when that return allows. So hopefully we can turn that faucet on a little bit more as the weeks go on, as our, our rates go down in Sacramento. And we're excited to do that, uh, but we'll obviously follow the, the guidance of health and safety officers in our area. So 
and I'll leave it for that and I'll let Margie go on with the, uh, the program. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Um, I do see a question here I'm going to answer really quick about supply lists. I know uh, Mr. O'Connor addressed that earlier. We don't actually have a supply list. The teachers will announce in class, usually through their syllabus, what it is that's required for those classes. So don't purchase anything until you know exactly what the teachers want. And they'll be very specific and let you know. Um, in terms of communicating with the dean's office for doctor visits, Dean Theodore, if you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that they just need to call the absence line. Correct. Okay, so if you just call the absence line and let us know your son's name and what time his appointment is, and if he will be returning to class, just leave that message and then uh, the dean's office will handle that. Is that correct? Correct. Perfect. Okay, okay so did you have- Marjorie, I think, I think now's a good time to just power through the rest of the, your planned presentation and we can pick up any other okay. um, Q&A questions at the end. Well then let's power through. Okay, so now we're on to BYOD, bring your own device. I would imagine that most of you have probably already purchased something for your sons to use during the school year. Um, but just remember, when we do return to campus, there are some things that we expect of the students. One of them is to come to school prepared, and that also means having their devices charged when they come to class. Um, we do not have charging stations. Uh, some teachers will allow students to charge in the classroom, but students should not plan on have been having the opportunity to charge on campus. You know, they're never going to let their phone die. Make them plug in their computer when they plug in their phone at night and they'll be fine. The security of the device is also up to the student. What we do recommend, however, is when you get a case or something for the device, just take a piece of tape, little piece of paper, put his name directly on the back of the device underneath the case. So that way, if something does happen, A, we know where to look to find the device. Um, and, and it just makes it so much easier for everybody. We have a very good system of tracking these down. Um, you know, I've been here a long time and I think I can only think of one or two devices we could not find. It's shocking how often these guys leave them lying around somewhere. Um, but it is gonna be his responsibility and, and we will, you know, kind of repeat that message to them when they do return to campus. Now, technical support is generally, we can help, and Mr. Garcia, if you could correct me if I'm wrong here, um, we can generally help with some of the smaller issues. If you're having trouble with eBooks, if you are, you're having trouble connecting to our Wi-Fi network, um, your email isn't working correctly. Those are things that would happen um, where you would go to the technology office, Mr. Garcia or Mr. Epstein would be able to help you with that. Anything larger than that, I dumped a Coke on my keyboard, that's not something we can help you with. And we would encourage you to contact Apple or Microsoft or Google for Chromebook support for that. So just keep that in mind. When you do purchase those devices, keep in mind where the support is going to come from if you run into something that we can't help you with. Okay, so VIP hours. VIP hours are gonna be the volunteer hours where we invite people to come onto campus and do some time, more of a community event. You know, you meet other families this way, you meet other parents this way. There is a, um, a requirement, a minimum number of hours that have to be done. But the way to find out that information is go to your help or helper profile, create one, and then be looking for those VIP opportunities um, on the website. Anytime you have any questions, just email volunteers at jesuithighschool.org and they will get back to you and answer any questions that you have about any of those hours. Okay, so our website is designed specifically to make it very simple for you to find what you need uh, quickly. So one of the things we have is the quick links and the quick links are right up here in the corner here. I'm gonna use my little laser thing. And that's gonna give you 
the most common things that people look for. If you can't find it there, you can always just click on this parent tab. We have student, parent, and alumni. And what that does is that we direct the messages for students differently than we would direct a message to a parent, differently than we would direct it to an alumni. So we do allow for those three different areas so you're not looking through a bunch of stuff that isn't really interesting to you. As a parent, you're looking for the textbook list, you just wanna go find it, that's where you would go see it. So if I have clicked on the parent link, this is the page that you're gonna see. And it, these boxes on this page are actually just going, they're going to change as events change, but what you'll see are the things that are most important to you as a parent on that landing page right there. And of course, we all love textbooks. Whoops, what did I do? Here we go, sorry. We all love our textbooks. And I know that's been a source of some, some concern for some parents. We have talked to the teachers. The teachers are aware that um, things aren't quite where we want them to be right now and that students may or may not have their books in time. Don't worry about that. Just get the books ordered when you can and the teachers will work with your sons. So much of our uh, readings and textbooks are in electronic format and will be accessed through their device. But not all of the books that we use in our curriculum fit that need of, of an ebook. So we are still using a combination of ebooks and traditional books. If you are on a Mac or an iPad, there is a different book list for you, and I'll show that to you in a moment. All the iBook titles have the correct link to the correct book because you're not going to be able to have a unique ISBN number in the App Store. So just trust that the link that we've provided for you is the correct one. If you are buying a traditional book or you're buying an ebook that is not an iBook, then yes, you do need to be mindful of the ISBN number because that's going to ensure that you've located the correct book. Like, for example, the Algebra 1 book, there's actually two versions of it. One at the bottom right-hand corner on the front page says Common Core. The other one doesn't. We use the Common Core book. If you buy the other book, they look exactly the same, except for that little notation, Common Core, you will have the wrong book. So it's really very important to verify that ISBN number when you're purchasing books. And if you have any question about that, do send me an email and I'm happy to take a look at what you're what you're looking at and make sure that it's the correct um, book. The textbook list is located on the website under parents. We do have two lists out there. They're broken down by operating system of the device that you purchased for your son. So you're either going to use the iOS list, which is going to be Mac or iPad, and, or the Windows Chrome list, which is going to be any Windows device or Chromebook. And then the books are listed by grade level and then by department. Now web access books, as freshmen, you don't have to worry about this so much. The upperclassmen, especially human geography, pre-calculus, Pearson does not send the access codes via email. They send it regular post office service. So the problem with that is, is it takes two or three weeks. And what I get is parents who go, well, I ordered it yesterday, why isn't it here? Well, because Pearson doesn't do it like that. So do keep that in mind. You don't really want to wait until the last minute. Also on the book list, what you'll see is if we can offer you an option between a traditional book and an ebook, we will list both books, but you only have to choose one. Now, I do have some families that do order both because, you know, they want to leave the traditional book at home because books are heavy, and then they use the ebook on the device. That is completely up to you. We give you that option. If it's available, so for example, with the world language this year, they, excuse me, have gone almost exclusively with ebooks. Um, it will be difficult to find a traditional book given the program that they're using right now. Remember when you're purchasing books that they're, they'll say, we're going to we're going to ship it with two day shipping. But what they don't tell you is that it's going to take them five to seven days to process your order, which really means you're not going to have a book for 10 days. 
do keep that in mind when you're ordering your book. And going back to the world language for a moment, the French and the Spanish book at any level will be distributed by that teacher the first week of instruction. So I know that a lot of you have already purchased those books. I appreciate that you've done that already, but do keep in mind those aren't going to come for a little while. So don't worry about those books coming. So I'm going to switch my screen here for a second because what I would like to do is show you a couple of things. So here we are on our website. I'm going to go and look at the parent. And I'm going to log out of this because it's going to make it look weird. I'm going to look at the parent page. And here's where you can see we have the calendars up here right now. Um, we have the announcement that the class schedules are available in PowerSchool, the book list if your son wanted to make a schedule change request. This is where all the parent stuff will live. So if we're going to go look at the textbook list, this is the page you're going to land on. And you'll see that I've said there's an Apple list and a Chrome list. So if I have my son's schedule in front of me and I want to purchase a book, what you do, let's assume that I'm going to go because I have a Windows device and I want to make sure that whatever books I purchase are usable on that particular device. Now, our website that we have is actually built out especially for us. I share with the books, um, the website builder, our list of books. And this is a dynamic site, meaning it's going to go out at that moment that you click that link and find the best prices it can right that time. This is not something that's cached. So if I'm going to go look for something for my freshman who's in English 1, I'm going to go to grade 9. I'm going to click on English. And I have two choices here. I have English 1 or English 1 Excel. Well, my son would be in English 1. And this is the only book that you need. Now, you'll see that there's a couple of choices to purchase the book from either the marketplace or Amazon. And the reason that those are broken up is Amazon um, forces you to do a search on their site only. And then the marketplace is all the other booksellers on the website. This is going to be half.com, textbooks.com, um, any, any of those other sites, aid books, all of those guys are going to be in the marketplace. So you as a parent can decide where you want to purchase it from. If I want to go to the marketplace, I'm going to click on the marketplace and it's going to tell me that right now there's one used book available from Ave Books for $28. If I want to buy that book, I'm just going to click on the buy button and it's going to take me to that website so that we can purchase the book directly from that seller. And then when you're done purchasing that book, you've proceeded to check out now you can go back, close this window, go back to here, and then you hit go back again. Now I'm going to go to my next class. Now I'm going to go to math. And my son's going to take Algebra 1. Now in Algebra 1, you still have the choice between Marketplace and Amazon. And then we've provided for you a link to Amazon for the calculator that's going to be required. If I click on Amazon, it's going to take me to the correct book that I want. You'll see that I've bought a couple of these in the recent past. Um, and it gives you options in terms of whether you want to buy it new or used, or I don't know why a math book would be collectible, but there we are. So you can buy a used book. Used books, as long as the pages are all there, are, are great. So I'm going to click on this Use button down here. And they're going to show me all of the used books that are available and who is selling them and how long it's going to take to get there. So if you wanted to buy this book that's being the fulfillment is by Amazon and you know it's going to get here quickly, add it to your cart and you can purchase that book. You're going to do that for each class your son takes. Now some of them are going to say, let me go back here. I'm going to go to visual and performing arts and I'm in choir. Let's say your son's in choir. You'll see there's no books listed. There's no books required, but there is a materials fee that will come into play later. So don't worry about that right now. That's not something that has to be dealt with 
right this minute. But if you go to digital photography, what you'll see is there is a book required. You can use the traditional or the ebook version. Uh, it is available on Kindle, I believe, on Amazon. And then you just go through and finish loading your cart if you're using Amazon or going to all the alternate sites if, if that's in fact what you'd like to do. The only caveat I would say is if your son is, is enrolled in a higher level math class, then you may have to go to grade 10 to find pre-calculus. If that happens to be what he's in or Algebra 2 honors, you're going to have to go to the next grade level. The grade level is not uh, indicative of whether or not he's going to get the right book. It's just that's when most kids fall into those classes. But if so, if you can't find something, you may have to go to the next grade level to find that book. Okay. So let me see, do we have any questions about books on here? Okay, so I have a when did they get their schedule? Your son should have received an email to his Jesuit email address explaining how to log into PowerSchool and see his schedule. Um, so you might ask him to take a look at that, and if he can't find it, uh, send me an email if you would please, and I will I will absolutely um, help you out with that. So hard copies are out of pocket are iBooks. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. iBooks are something you would have to purchase. Um, you know, and generally with iBooks, especially with the algebra, um, what they'll do is they'll tell you that the app is free, which is wonderful and lovely, but the content is $20. So do make sure that you're watching when you're buying those books online to make sure that you understand what it is. I mean, that iBook for $20 is going to be twice as much as you would pay for a traditional book on Amazon for that Algebra 1 book. So do keep that in mind. Um, I don't see anything else there. So I'm back to my textbook list. I'm going to go back to the landing page. And I'm going to show you these quick links right here. The daily schedule will be there, the calendar and events, um, the campus store, health and safety. All of these things are going to be very helpful to you. So like, for example, when Dean Theodore was talking about the attendance line and you don't remember the, the number, come to your quick link and there you'll see all the department directory and all the phone numbers that you'll need. Um, let me see. This. So do we have any other questions about anything that we've talked about tonight so far? I'm looking, I'm not seeing anything. I'll open up to the other folks on the call here. If you look at any questions I see, they might want to be able to respond to. There is one question, um, and you may have touched on it briefly, but if you could just reiterate if you have a first period flex period or if your flex period starts as the first period that day, mm -hmm. is there a login or an attendance check needed for a flex no. period of distance learning? Not during distance learning. Yeah, the, the question was about whether or not, basically, do you need to check in somewhere on Zoom for a flex period in distance learning? Uh, and so if your son's schedule just says flex, then the answer is no. Um, now, there may be messages, you know, in at some point from a counselor or from someone else on campus who wants to schedule a meeting with the student or the student will have the ability to schedule particular meetings um, to meet with folks, but that's, uh, we're not going to run kind of a, a giant zoom for uh, for the flex periods for students. So that's that time is kind of um, at, to be used at their discretion in distance learning mode. Obviously a very different scenario when we return to on campus instruction at some point. In addition to flex periods being a good time to schedule meetings with counselors and other things in distance learning, the physical education department is putting together um, physical activity uh, activities and suggestions for things that students can do to get up and move. Uh, flex periods would be a great time during the course of the digital learning day for students to take advantage of those opportunities to get up away from the computer, do a little bit of physical activity, stimulate their brains and their bodies, 
uh, and then be prepared to be back uh, and ready for their next period class on time. I would suggest uh, that students set an alarm for themselves um, on their phone or um, wherever they may set an alarm, um, maybe for five minutes prior to the start of the next class period so that they are in their next class period after flex on time. And I just went back and looked at an, uh, an older question and said, my son logged into PowerSchool and doesn't see a schedule. Both Elizabeth and Claudia mentioned that they should not be using the app, which is absolutely correct. If you are on PowerSchool on a desktop computer and you look under my schedule, there is a tab directly under his name that says matrix view. If you're looking at the schedule view, you're not going to see anything because we haven't started school yet. So you would need to look at the matrix view in order to see his entire schedule. So that might be part of the issue there too. Um, there's, a, oh, go ahead. There's, a, there's a question here about the um, student teacher, teacher to student ratio. So our average class sizes for this year uh, will be around 20. Um, some departments it'll be under and some departments it'll be just just a hair north of uh, 20 in terms of class sizes. We achieved that by adding the extra period to the schedule, which if, if anyone was um, on a previous session where I talked about our choice of designing the schedule the way that we did, um, we have asked teachers to teach an additional period, but we spread the students out more. So students didn't sign up for more classes. That's why your son is likely to have two flex, um, two flex periods in at least one semester. Um, but in order to achieve that, that we did that in order to achieve the smaller class sizes for this school year. There was a question here about the freshman retreat and the answer is, uh, uh, are we going to replace the freshman retreat in any way? And the answer is yes. Uh, how exactly we're not entirely sure, but before that happens, there is a program from campus ministry taking place to engage the freshmen and big brothers um, either in flex periods at lunch times and after school in the digital environment or the, rather the remote environment to begin inviting them into the campus ministry program, into the Big Brother program. When it's uh, safe to do so, the, the campus ministry team has a variety of plans just ready to play for the freshman experience. And uh, the campus ministry student leadership team has been creating a variety of things for um, the freshmen, both in that remote environment, but also when they return to campus to give them as best they can that experience of introduction and welcome that we want our freshmen to have, especially from other students. So the answer is yes, we're working on it. So I also see a question here about, would you please explain the process for ordering a Spanish book? I'm happy to do that. So we're on the textbook screen again. I'm going to go back to my Windows device. My darling son is going to take Spanish one. So I'm going to click on Spanish one and I'm going to click on publisher distributor and it's going to take you to this page that says ebook purchasing. And the reason for that is, is parents can't directly purchase the book from the publisher. So we have to purchase the book for you. So you're just buying the book from Jesuit essentially. So you would just go down and choose the Spanish book. Now I know it's a little confusing because it says Spanish 1, 1XL, 2, 2A, it has all of the levels of Spanish. And that's just because of the platform that the, the uh, publisher uses allows us to only have one, uh, the, the book will be associated by the instructor code. Uh, so don't worry about that. You don't need to identify to me what level of Spanish it is. I just need to know which do you want Spanish or do you want French? So, so then you would just go through, put your student's name in there, let us know what his year level is, your email address, uh, phone number, all that information, hit save registrant, and then that's going to ask you for your payment information. This gets collected and sent to me, and then I will take that and send that off to the teachers so they know who have purchased their book. At the same time, this Theology One course is the Ignatian graphic novel. We do need all the parents to purchase that as well. And what we're going to do there is distribute that. We'll send out some information later on to get these to the kids prior to the first day of school. Um, and the same thing with integrated science. Those students that are taking integrated science, 
We, you could not purchase the book. We had to purchase it for you. And I have the books on campus. You just need to come up with a good, safe way to get the, those books to you. But that's how you would go ahead and order the Spanish book um, on the website. So folks can keep asking questions and this, this team can keep answering questions. I'm gonna hop off now, but before I do, I just wanted to say two quick things. There's one, ask questions, we're here to help. Our job is to, as administrators, is to minister to this community. That's what we're here to do. So, so please keep using us to support you and your sons in this transition. And the second thing I wanna say I'm excited for is I'm excited for your sons to meet their teachers. The teachers at Jesuit High School are the engine that makes this mission work. They run it, that's, that's where it happens every day. So all of the details we're working on are really important just to get them to that place to build those relationships with those teachers who care deeply for your sons, for the material they're teaching um, and the mission of Jesuit High School. So that's what we should be excited for right now is those students and those teachers beginning their work together and beginning their high school experience at Jesuit High School. So I'm praying for you all. Wish us the best of luck as we begin this unique school year. You are in great hands here with this team of leaders and uh, I look forward to seeing you and being with you in person at some point. Take care and God bless. I will be happy to answer the first question here about the online store. The question is, I know the online store is available online, but will there be an opportunity to purchase any items on campus? Um, so generally speaking, there are not a lot of opportunities to purchase items on campus outside of um, activities, purchasing t-shirts and things from specific clubs and things of that nature. The Marauders Cove itself is only open uh, at most one day a week. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong to anyone else on this panel, uh, there are no plans for the Marauders Cove to be open for um, in-person shopping uh, at the current time. Correct, Dean Theodore. Mm -hmm. Once back on campus though, Dean, uh, we will be having more access with the retail center in the Welcome Center. Yes, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a question here about whether transfer students get a big brother. Uh, the big brother process is, is specifically designed to support freshmen. Uh, however, in the past, we've used members of our student council to um, give, tu give tours to transfer students and to kind of be uh, a friendly face at the beginning of the school year. Um, Dr. Desmond, do you know if we are still using that particular avenue? Um, I not through campus ministry, but possibly through student activities. So right. I'll, I'll look into that. I, I have the uh, parent name that um, asked that question. So I'll be sure to um, touch base with her. That usually comes up as part of the transfer student orientation, um, which again, will take, will take place uh, in the coming weeks. Yes, our director of uh, admissions, Mr. Matthew Ramos, does have a unique plan specifically for transfer students to make sure that they are supported um, as they transition to, to our campus. Uh, the, the question com comes up again here about recording classes. Um, so we're, we're asking teachers to do an awful lot in this particular environment this year um, and recording and hosting and posting and sharing of uh, class sessions is, is not going to be one of them. And uh, that being said, there are, you know, students are still encouraged to reach out to their teachers if they miss a class session, um, if they feel like they need extra assistance with understanding an assignment. We'll have office hours that teachers will be hosting at least once a week uh, for their classes for them to kind of get caught up. And then during short weeks, there'll be even longer office hours sessions in the afternoons that teachers will offer. Um, so there's going to be plenty of other avenues for students to get caught up. But because the synchronous design of our schedule um, requires that teachers uh, launch Zooms and take attendance and then um, you know follow up and post things on Classroom. We did not want to add the additional requirement that uh, teachers needed to record their class sessions and we also didn't want to provide any way for um, there to be incentive for students to not come to a synchronous class session um, because you know watching a recording uh, is not going to is not going to capture that. Um, so there are ways that, that students can still get caught up the same as they would in a traditional schooling environment where they might be gone for a day or two. 
they can start by asking a friend or they can send an email to the teacher and be proactive as well. Um, Colin is being asked by a future marauder. So thank you, Keegan, for yep. doing that. Um, just remember, um, as Colin was sharing, if you're ill, you're ill. And um, your Google Classroom and your connection with your teacher is your best avenue to then get caught back up. Yep. Someone also asked how big is their freshman class? So who has or would like to share the approximate number of the class of 2024? I'm looking it up right now so I can give a, an accurate answer. You just give me one moment. There we the go. Dean. Currently, currently there are 261 freshmen enrolled for uh, the 2020-2021 school year. Two sixty one, Dean. You said two hundred and sixty one. Yes. Great. So there's a, also a question here that says, "Is a physical required to start the school year?" And the answer to that is yes. You do have to have a physical on file with us uh, in order to start the school year. And we generally, I mean, we're into August now, so it's kind of a moot point at this point, but. We generally recommend that people do it during the summer. That way, if your son plays a sport, it actually is valid for the entire year. What we don't want to have happen is your son's uh, physical to run out in the middle of his sports season because that will make him ineligible. So as a freshman, it's required to start the school year and to play sports. After that, it's just required to play sports. You don't need to repeat it every year unless your son is an athlete. Um, let's see, theology book. Let's go back to theology here. So the Understanding Catholic Christianity book is actually, we only have it listed as a traditional book because that is what department has requested. So they want the kids to have that book in hand rather than an ebook. Um, so you could buy the ebook for your own purposes, but for in class, he is going to need to have to have need to have that. He's going to need the traditional book. Experience with that, Ms. Wagner, my son, who's an incoming junior, has used that book for several years. So the, the traditional book will be valued and utilized. Thank you very much. That's good news. Um, will virtual VIP hours be available or will the requirement change? I would recommend reaching out to um, Kim Kalmbach and ask that question. You can get her at volunteers at jesuithighschool.org. I don't know that answer. Do you know it, Fadia? Margie, could you repeat that, please? So will virtual VIP hours be available or will the 25 hour requirement change? Um, I, I haven't heard yet. Okay. So we'll, they'll, they'll communicate that out in a staying connected email. We will, and there are still um, volunteer opportunities that a variety of departments on campus are still needing help with. You might um, be able to volunteer to do some um, mail stuffing from home or some other professional support like photography or other talents you may have. So still get logged into that VIP portal and you'll see those opportunities send you alerts as we have the need. And we certainly couldn't do it without all of our families. So thank you. So somebody asked the question, where do we find the physical form? If you go to our website and click on athletics, and then click on athletic forms. You're, what you're looking for is the pre-participation physical form. And it's a PDF right there. So you just need to um, print it off and take it with you to the doctor. Okay, so how do we check and see if the physical was done? <laughs> I can't remember what I did yesterday either let alone months ago. Uh, what I would do is reach out to um, Robin Cummings in the athletics department. She will be able to tell you 
whether or not she has a phys physical on file for your son. You are also able to log into your final forms account and it will have just like a traffic light, red, yellow, green, and you can see if the form has been completed and filed. So your final forms, which was part of your registration process, you can view your forms that are uploaded. Thank you, Elizabeth. Dean Theodore, do we know when volleyball tryouts are going to happen or did everything move to the spring? Everything has moved. All of the uh, volleyball for this season, I believe, has been moved to the fall, quote unquote, fall season. Okay. Uh, which officially starts competitions in December, January timeframe. They won't start practicing and do tryouts and whatnot until um, my guess would be November. Thank you. There will, be some, there will be some conditioning opportunities for the fall, the traditional fall sports and volleyball uh, sometime a, around or after Labor Day. Thank you. And, and when it comes to athletics and sports, remind your sons to keep an eye on the emails that are sent and the staying connected that are sent and the website they can go to the athletic tab on the website a lot of our information is will be posted there as well but but we make announcements and we post things on the website we we try very hard to communicate um, the other thing i would encourage all of your sons to do is to make sure that they are checking their emails every day probably twice a day because we will communicate almost exclusively, especially in the distance learning environment, by email with your sons. Um, says first available appointment is August 31st for a physical. That's fine. Make the appointment and do it then. That's not a problem. Just have it, just make sure he gets it into us, um, you know, right after that happens. Uh, let's see. My son is interested in the esports team. Is that a club? It is actually. Uh, it is actually a club. Um, we started our esports team last year. Um, our faculty advisor is Mary Friedman. Uh, she makes it a lot of fun uh, for for the club members. And that's a perfect segue for me to mention that on um, Friday, September. 18th, uh, we're having a, our collaboration time that morning is going to be set aside just to make sure that we get all that club information out to our freshmen at all grade levels, actually. Um, so sure. uh, that's up on our calendar and we'll be sending them lots of email reminders about that. Were we delayed it because uh, actually every year we, we wait a little bit uh, to give students a little bit of time to get acclimated to the start of the new school year. Um, and then we inundate them with lots of great opportunities uh, for getting involved in school beyond just um, in their classrooms. Okay, so there's another question here. It says on the helper app, there's no opportunities listed. Is that correct? I suspect that things are a little quiet right now. Is that correct, Fadia? It's possible. Um, there, there, there are some things that actually people may have already signed up for, but they were uh, volunteer opportunities um, actually for your sons. Um, so we, we, I'm glad they're not up there because we wouldn't want you volunteering for <laughs> some of these um, little surprises that are coming up um, for, for your son. So it is possible that there is nothing up there right now. But like Mrs. Sands mentioned, there will be lots of virtual opportunities in the works. And I would just, I would just recommend that you um, keep checking in on the helper, helper, helper site and also make sure you're checking in on our website under parents because some of that information will get posted there as well. Okay. Will there be a freshman class name list that students can reference for their new classmates? Uh, there is a class of 2024 Google Classroom page that students can scroll through the, the list of people on and they can see the names of all their classmates. Um, but we can also think about putting together kind of a, a master list of the names. Um, we won't do it anymore. 
I know, I know, but for this particular. Oh instance. no, sorry, I was answering him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the guy on the other side of the room. <laughs> uh, but yeah, starting starting with the class of 2024 at, um, classroom page, and then as soon as they start um, populating into their Google Classroom pages for their classes, uh, they'll be able to see the names of all of their classmates by um, each section that they're in as well. And then Zoom is pretty helpful. Someone I was I was talking to some uh, some teachers yesterday about best practices for distance learning, and they said it's actually really helpful on Zoom because someone's name is always displayed under where they're speaking. So it'll be teachers will learn students' names even faster that way instead of having to look down at the seating chart to try to remember. Really good idea. <laughs> Uh, let's see, if you just received our son's physical, what's the best way to get it to you? Um, you can upload it to final forms and then just pop it in the mail to us. That's fine. Definitely keep a copy of it for yourself in case something horrible happens. But you can upload the physical in final forms. Go back to it, use the credentials that you created when you first went into final forms. And that's where you can upload documents and, and make changes to phone numbers and all that kind of stuff can happen right there. So we have a, you just completed our son's info on final forms. When should we expect a schedule, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, I need to, I mean, I'm, so this is day, uh, what is it, day three for me <laughs> on the job here. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing a, I'm doing a lot over the summer, but this is so not not tonight, unfortunately. Um, we will uh, if if you just got into final forms, I think that we can. Margie is is Friday probably a, a doable thing. Friday, doable, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you since you sorry the person who posted this posted it as an anonymous attendee. So one thing to do is if you feel like your question was. Uh, if you didn't see an answer to your question, we tried to type answers to almost all of them or address them verbally. If you didn't feel like you got your question answered, feel free to email myself, um, you know, any of us uh, assistant principals um, or Margie. Margie is amazing, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you guys all realize, but you just got a presentation from the person who should be your best friend, a Jesuit, <laughs> if you're a parent. Um, you're so sweet. <laughs> so so please, please reach out to us, uh, as Mr. Wood said before he left. We're, we're here to help. Um, and especially if you have a, a very specific particular question to your situation, it'd be most helpful to do that via email. That way we can set up phone calls. Um, I'm working from home, but I'm able to, I'm able to, to call folks uh, from home as I'm able, as I need to. So. Okay. Is the audition date listed on the website for the fall play still happening? Uh, I don't, I, I need to double check if that's still matching up, but the, the information yeah. about how the Black Box Theater will be doing the fall play is uh, it's forthcoming. They have a great plan. Oh, good. And they were oh. trying to get around those same dates, but I believe we'll get a little more information out. Um, is that right, Dr. Desmond, this week or next week regarding mm -hmm. the final dates? Yes, we um, put a general announcement in last Friday, Staying Connected, and then once those audition dates are finalized, they'll be added uh, to the calendar and to Staying Connected. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we've, we've answered them all, it looks like. Margie, there is one more. Um, you talked a lot about textbooks, but many of our incoming freshmen were used to that long supply list that they've gotten from their middle school teachers. Right. How are they communicating supplies um, to their students? In so, it's on, it'll be on their syllabi. If they have something specific that they want students to have access to, it'll be on their syllabi. Um, so teachers will be communicating that to them via their syllabus uh, during that, those three days of special schedules, uh, the first week of classes. So after orientation, when they meet with each individual teacher, they'll get a chance to, to kind of hear what each teacher might expect them to have, which it might be a composition notebook or a spiral notebook, um, that kind of thing. Don't buy anything yet, except a calculator. Go get a calculator. Everything yeah. else, hold off on that. Pens and pencils. <laughs> Pens and pencils. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming. We are grateful. This is not, again, the, the way that we had hoped to meet with all of you, but we, we are glad to have you here. 
If you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to us. Our website is a huge cornucopia of information out there that, that is available to you. And if, certainly if you don't see it there, let us know and um, we will answer whatever questions you have. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a nice night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Please email if you have questions.